Six years ago the DARPA Grand Challenge invited engineers to come up with humanoid robots that could perform basic tasks, like standing up and walking. Today, Boston Dynamics makes those experiments look like ancient history. The same impressive developments have been taking place in transportation, space exploration, finance, image technology, medicine, biology, gaming and many more. What is common in all these developments is the fuel that make them possible. Artificial intelligence. And this is just the beginning. Max Tegmark is a Swedish-American physicist, cosmologist, and machine learning researcher. He is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the president of the Future of Life Institute, a nonprofit organization that focuses on making tomorrow's most powerful technologies beneficial for humanity. Professor Tegmark was at corporate event organized by Dynatrace, a leading tech company in cloud services. He explains why AI will become even more intelligent and what we can do to make sure that humans will not be left behind and be dominated by artificial intelligence. It all starts with the question, how far will it go? I think of this question in terms of this abstract landscape of tasks, where the elevation represents how hard it is for AI to do each task, and the sea level represents what AI can do today. The sea level is obviously rising as the power of AI grows, so there's a kind of a global warming going on in this task landscape, and one obvious takeaway is to be really careful with careers at the waterfront, which are of course about to be disrupted by automation. But an even bigger question is, how high will the water end up? rising. Will it eventually end up flooding all land? With AI matching human ability at all tasks? This is a definition of artificial general intelligence, AGI. And by this definition, people who say, nah, there'll always be jobs that humans can do better than machines, are simply saying that there will never be AGI. Now, if you think this sounds like crazy sci-fi, I want you to be aware that there's another idea which sounds like even more crazy sci-fi, which is super intelligence. The idea is very simple. If we ever reach AGI, then of course from then on, AI progress will be driven primarily not by humans, but by AI, which could go much faster than the typical human research and development time scale of years. And this raises this very controversial idea that um, AI might very rapidly through recursive self-improvement leave human intelligence far, far, behind. Now, is any of this actually going to happen? And when? Well, some people, like my MIT colleague Rodney Brooks, will say, well, it won't happen for hundreds of years. On the other hand, Demis Asabis, who leads Google DeepMind, is much more optimistic and thinks it's going to happen within decades and is working to try to make it happen. Most AI researchers in recent surveys have, sh have predicted that it most likely will happen within decades. That's artificial general intelligence. What about super intelligence? Well, let's listen in to what uh, Demis Asabis and a bunch of other tech and, and, and academics and AI and others have to say. So before I asked if super intelligence is possible at all according to the laws of physics, now I'm asking, will it actually happen? Yes, no, or it's complicated? A little bit complicated, but yes. Uh, yes, and if it doesn't, something terrible has happened to prevent it. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes. That was probably. probably. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> the fact that Elon has a sense of humor, we clearly need to take away from this that we have to take this seriously this possibility of superintelligence happening, and perhaps in our lifetime. So what would that mean if this actually happens? Let's let it sink in a little bit. Well, imagine that technology suddenly becomes limited not by human intelligence, by our ability to invent the stuff, but simply by the laws of physics, which set a limit no matter how smart you are. What would that mean? Well, for example, Computation. When my grandma was born, since then, we've improved 
how much computation you can buy for a dollar with, by, by 10 million, million, million times. But we also know, because of my colleague Seth Lloyd, who worked it out, that you can, the laws of physics say you can do another million, 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 million times better in terms of how much compute you can get out of one kilogram of stuff in, in one second. And with superintelligence, you might be able to reach that pretty quickly. If you're interested in energy and energy efficiency and sustainability, you know, it's worth remembering that from basic physics, what we do today is really pathetic. Like burning gasoline extracts only 0.0000005% of the energy that Einstein says we should be able to get out of the thing. Physics says that there are all these other technologies which are vastly more effective than anything we can build today. We haven't been able to, with our human minds, figure out how to build that tech yet, but it's possible. Superintelligence might be able to get us there pretty quickly. If you really like to think big and would like yourself or your kids maybe to travel out elsewhere in the solar system, maybe uh, instead of going to Vegas, go a little bit farther out, enjoy some of the great resources out there in the cosmos, maybe go to an O'Neill cylinder instead of Vegas where you can have a wonderful, comfortable experience somewhere in the outer solar system in this little spinning cylinder. You know, Instead of thinking about this as some sci-fi thing that's going to take 10,000 years for humans to figure out and build, think of it as something that, again, might happen in your lifetime, in your kid's lifetime, because superintelligence could figure out how to do the engineering. And don't worry about the money. If it's all built by robots, you can just think of it as the outer solar system just rearranges itself gradually, automatically, into a, a form that's more pleasant to be in for us. So think big. Now, how? As we segue into the second part, the steering part of this, of this talk, can we get our technology to actually go in this direction, make sure we bring to bear some of these amazing possibilities rather than mess up in some way? Now, to help with this, I co-founded the Future of Life Institute, a small nonprofit aimed at the beneficial technology use. And our goal is simply for the future of life to exist and be as uh, inspiring as possible. Now, the key challenge here, as I see it, is I, that I love technology in every way in which today is better than the Stone Age and you know, it is because of technology. And I'm confident that we can have an inspiring future with, with high tech. But it's going to require winning the wisdom race, the race between the growing power of the technology and the wisdom with which we manage it. Now, challenge here is we're used to winning this wisdom race with not so powerful tech by just learning from mistakes. First we invented fire, messed up a bunch of times, then invented the fire extinguisher. With cars we had a lot of tears and heartache, then we invented the seat belt and the traffic light and so on. And we're kind of used to this strategy but with more powerful technology like nuclear technology, like certainly artificial general intelligence and super intelligence, Learning from mistakes goes from being a good strategy to being a lousy strategy. And we're much better off actually being proactive rather than reactive and getting things right the first time, because that might be the only time that we get. Just think about it. Before NASA launched that Apollo 11 rocket to the moon that we saw earlier, they systematically figured out everything that can go wrong when you put three people on top of explosive fuel tanks and send them somewhere where no one can help them. And there's a lot that can go wrong. Is that scaremongering? No. That was exactly what we at MIT call safety engineering, the safety engineering that guaranteed the success of the mission. And that's what I'm telling you today should be our strategy also with ever more powerful artificial intelligence. Think through what could go wrong so that we can guarantee that it goes right. And I'll just give a shout out to three such principles here very briefly. One of them is simply that we should avoid an arms race in algorithms that decide to kill people. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? And uh, the idea is really simple. Just any science can be used for new ways of harming people or new ways of helping people. And for example, biology today, we associate with new cures and chemistry with new materials, not with new ways of killing people, because those scientists 
worked really hard to get bans on biological and chemical weapons. And AI research similarly are really an idealistic bunch, as I know you are, who are listening to this, who want to make sure that the AI development gets steered to all these awesome uses and not perverted to do really dumb stuff. Another one of these Asilomar principles is that we should make sure to mitigate AI-fueled inequality. My opinion is that if we can manage to grow the world GDP by a massive factor, and we still can't figure out how to share all this wealth in such a way that everyone gets better off, well then, shame on us. A third principle I'd like to introduce by ask, having you pause for a moment and just ask yourself, has your computer ever crashed? Okay, now I think you're persuaded in the wisdom of investing in AI safety research so that we can transform today's buggy and hackable computers into really robust AI systems that we can trust. Because as we put AI in charge of ever more infrastructure and decisions that affect people's lives, we want to make sure that they don't malfunction and harm us or get hacked and get turned against us. And let's also not get sidetracked by having Hollywood make us worry about the wrong things. Because this AI safety research has to also include work in what we call AI alignment. The biggest threat from AGI is not that it's going to turn evil like in some silly movie, but that it's going to turn really, really competent and go off and accomplish goals that just aren't aligned with our goals. For example, the West African rhino was driven extinct by us humans, not because we're some kind of evil rhino haters, but because we're smarter than them and our goals didn't align with theirs, so tough luck for the rhinos, right? So to make sure that we don't put ourselves in the position of those rhino rhinos as we build AGI, let's make sure that AI is built so that it can understand our human goals and adopt them and retain them. And if we can steer there for our AGI to accomplish our goals. Where do we want to steer towards? What's our destination? This is a very important question, not just for humanity as a whole, but also for our businesses, of course. And I want to leave you with two pieces of advice that are equally applicable to both of these cases. First, draw a really clear red line between what you consider to be acceptable and unacceptable uses of AI. Tell everybody about it, stick to it. And then think hard about the acceptable part and try to articulate what's really exciting because the, you really need a positive vision clearly articulated. Any good CEO knows that this is the fundamental driver of, of collaboration. And this is equally true, of course, in geopolitics. Yet, you know, if I get, like, I get a student coming into my office at MIT, and if I ask, as I always do first, you know, where do you want to be in 10 years? I want her to come in with fire in her eyes and be like, this is where I want to be in 10 years. And then we can talk about the challenges and how to avoid problems, right? Now, that might seem like a pretty obvious thing, because just thinking about everything that can go wrong is just going to turn you into a paranoid hy hypochondriac. But then go turn on the news, and it's like 90% fear and all the things we should worry about, right? And so little about the, the positives. And then turn on and <laughs> go to a movie, see what Hollywood has to say, and notice that almost all movies about the future are dystopias. We're getting it all wrong. It's incredibly important that you all ask yourself what sort of future you are really passionate about. Articulate these shared positive visions. That's what's going to make us get there. I know some of you might be thinking, oh, Max is so naive. Of course, there's no shared positive vision at all that US and China and Russia and everyone else is going to agree on. But that is so not true because the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have been adopted by basically every country on Earth. And these are challenging noble goals, so let's start with them. This is a paper we recently wrote in Nature Com showing that artificial intelligence can help us accomplish these sustainable development goals better and faster. And if we really start continuing towards AGI and beyond, 
let's not, not just aim towards them at, by 2030, let's accomplish all of them. Let's raise our ambition level to even go far beyond them. You know, why should we limit ourselves to just talking about no poverty when we can have amazing prosperity for everybody? Why should we just talk about climate action? Let's raise our ambition to, to totally sustainable Earth, etc. There is no shortage of shared positive vision right now on Earth. Let's go get it. Let's do it. So to summarize, I hope I've persuaded you that AGI is the ultimate game-changing ch technology. And it's coming. Whether we like it or not, it's coming. And now, in this cosmic perspective, it's, it's pretty easy to start feeling insignificant, both in con contemplating the vastness of our universe and how short the human life is in the cosmic time scale of things, and also by thinking that, hey, you know, I'm just one dude out of like almost 8 billion people on this planet. But you are not insignificant. It's many of you game changers watching this right now who are going to be making these changes and are going to figure out how to steer this technology in good directions and are going to make it actually happen. My homework to you is be proactive. Think in advance how to steer things and where you want to go with it. And by doing this, we can be and we will be the masters of our own destiny by actually building it. Thank you.